Occupy a Job on Wall Street is an autobiographical novel about New York City in the aughts, centering around a protagonist who is mentored by three sociopaths. Episode 61, New Amsterdam. European financial institutions have had a tough time of it lately, and it's not just Deutsche Bank, whose incompetence and money laundering you might be familiar with even if you aren't in the business. In part, the European Union's banks are in trouble because of their moribund economy and the ECB's negative interest rate folly. But it's also a relative thing. The big U.S. banks were, in typical American fashion, forced to take their medicine early and came through the financial crisis stronger. But as I said, EU banks are in trouble. So I thought I might kick some of them while they're down. Nowadays, for instance, the Dutch banks are just big compliance institutions that occasionally trade stocks. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, the reason that there are so many banks in the Netherlands, despite the fact that a postage stamp would cover their country on most maps, is the Dutch basically invented trading. They liked it so much that they'd sell insurance on individual sailors heading to the New World in the 16th century. The brokers on these transactions were known as soul keepers. And as many of you may know, the Dutch once ruled New York and even put a wall up in their efforts to keep the English out, which is why the southern tip of Manhattan is known as Wall Street. In 2006, a lot of these banks thought they could stage a bit of a comeback here, and none more than ABN AMRO. The business was going gangbusters back then, so their New York office gets approval to basically hire anyone they want. And what they want is a top producer, a big swinging dick from HSBC that we'll call FD. FD was a brilliant, flawed character whose motor ran at three times the RPM of anyone else. If he had chosen a career in the military, he'd be known as OAF, Operator as Fuck. He was just incredibly good at his job at HSBC. His clients loved him, never threw his position traders under the bus, and managed risk like a champ. The problem with FD can be found in his nickname. You see, FD stood for Flash Dancers, which is a strip club in Midtown that he found himself having lunch at every day. After ABN hired him away, they also found out he had a bad drinking problem. As the stock market continued to soar, that then became a bad drinking and coke problem. So one day, FD's at his desk, managing client orders and ABN's central risk book, when he invites his coke dealer up to the office to top them up ahead of a big client dinner coming up. Now, this is back when trades were done in person, over the phone, a concept that seems quaint now. Indeed, order management systems weren't that pervasive, and Bloomberg IB was largely restricted by hedge fund compliance departments. So, for example, if you wanted to buy 30 million Nokia, you'd call up FD and ask him to make you an offer. If you were a good client, and we were a good client back then, he'd sell you the whole thing on the offer. You'd take a report, and now ABN was short Nokia. That sounds like a problem for them, being on the wrong side of smart money, but because FD was operator as fuck, he'd manage his way out and often even make the bank money on that position after a 20 basis point commission. In any case, FD invites his coke dealer up and forgets to switch off what was known back then as a box or hoot, which was a system that would relay his risk position all the way around the firm. So everyone at ABN hears him arguing with his coke dealer. All his phones are lighting up to tell him to shut up about the price of eight balls, and by the time his assistant jumps up to turn off his speaker, it's too late and FD finds himself talking to human resources. Nowadays, if you come into work a bit hungover, you might lose your job at a bank. But it was a more permissive atmosphere back then, and to his credit, FD falls on his sword to protect the other traders at ABN. He admits he has a problem, and the bank sends him and his whole family to Malibu or something for rehab. So a couple of months later, FD is back on the trading desk and he's all work, church, and home now. Clients and fellow ABN traders embrace his return. Life and business is good for a while, until he goes to the dentist to get his wisdom teeth removed. On the way out the door, they give him a prescription for OxyContin. He fills it, and it's like being shot out of a cannon. We thought he had a problem with booze and coke, but OxyContin is like kryptonite to this guy. He doesn't even make it back to work just head straight to flash dancers, and they find him handcuffed to a bed at the Four Seasons some 48 hours later. So FD has fallen off the rails, and one of the biggest events on Wall Street is coming up. It's a fundraiser for a big charter school called Success Academy, which is a hobby horse for many people in the financial sector. It's Wall Street's way of virtue signaling. 
They trot out all these underprivileged urban kids on stage, and the whole thing is god-awfully sanctimonious and painful. But it's the sort of thing you have to attend, so one of my friends, who we'll call Cash, invites me to join his table. During our pregame, the two of us run into FD at Whiskey Park. He's a bit hyped up, but we don't see the danger signals and invite him to join us at the event. Once we're settled in at the table, the charter school starts trotting these little kids out on stage. They're all black with a couple of Hispanics thrown in. In retrospect, you can see FD's mind ticking over with suicidal intentions, and he turns to my friend Cash, who is also black, and says, You work at Lehman, right? Cash says yes, and FD comes back with, So you're saying you put the brothers in Lehman Brothers? That's not what he was saying at all. But it's actually pretty funny, and Cash isn't the sensitive kind either. The only other time I heard him get upset about race on Wall Street was when his trading desk was watching Obama leave the White House for the last time, and while he's getting on the helicopter, one of his fellow sales traders yelled out, Back of the bus, Mr. President! But this is ten years prior. Trump's keeping himself busy knocking the lunch out of Stormy Daniels, and race didn't seem to be as raw of a topic back then. So Cash laughs along with FD. But FD's not done. He starts riffing on how both he and Cash can pull out a black card, but his version is an Amex. Cash laughs at this and claps FD hard on the back while he does so, which I recognize as a warning, but FD is so hammered on opiates and booze he just doesn't catch it. This goes on for a little while until Cash has had enough, stands up, and yells out, What do I look like, Sammy Davis Jr.? This gets a lot of people's attention, and FD, under pressure, tells the following story to the assembled crowd. All the Dutch banks celebrate a version of Christmas in early December that involves many of them dressing up in blackface as a character known as Zwarte Piet. And we're not talking a little bit of blackface like that idiot Trudeau from Canada, but dark black makeup, bright red lipstick, and big curly hair wigs. Not only that, the black-faced character crawls down chimneys and tortures children. Now this is back in 2006 when you just couldn't fact-check something like that as instantly as you can right now. Everyone thinks FD has lost the plot and is making up this fantastical story so that Cash doesn't bash his brains in. FD is turfed out of the fundraiser and railroaded out of the business soon after. But here's the thing. Everything he said was true. ABN, ING, and the Dutch banks do celebrate the holidays in blackface alongside St. Nicholas. Look it up. That's a thing. But wow. FD's meltdown was quite the shit show, and he handled it like a moron. Episode 62 of Occupy a Job on Wall Street will be out soon. And remember, there's always going to be a lot of idiocy on the way to wisdom.